So I guess we can start because we're all here. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Is this working well? Yes. Right. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all. This is really packed. I guess we're all very interested in the topic, and uh, it makes sense. It's for us all. So my name is Paola Antonelli, and I'm the Director of Research and Development at MoMA. That's one of my hats. I'm also a Senior Curator of Architecture and Design here at the museum. Uh, I know that many of you have been here several times, so you already know what these salons are about. But just to give you a little recap, the so-called Department of R&D, which is basically Erika Petrillo and half of me, it's a big department, um, studies how museums can be the R&D of society. Uh, in other words, we think that we can be gastrointestinal systems, outsourced gastrointestinal <laughs> systems for your thoughts, that we can help you deal with things in your life by just being here and listening to you and sometimes, sometimes bouncing things back. We have this great resource that our artists, we have also art, but artists in particular really help us uh, deal with these very tough uh, issues that exist in life. Some are as tough as death. We had a salon on death in the past, one about silence, one about truth, one about the future, and many others, and you can find them all online if you search MoMA R&D. Tonight we're here to discuss aging, to discuss becoming old, to discuss the idea of becoming old more than even the reality. And as usual, uh, I have put together, actually Erica has put together a fantastic introduction that I will not even be able to scratch at the surface because it's so deep. But once again, afterwards, please feel free to go back to the website so that you can really delve and observe the slides and take in all the different nuances that come with the concept of aging and all the data that we have been uh, really gathering about them. So new aging is the title that we have used because the concept of aging changes with time, changes in history, changes in geography. And that's what we would like to discuss tonight. Not only all the cliches that have been banded about, about the fact that the world is aging rapidly, but also what it means to age and is age an, is, is aging and old age a new form of youth, which you'll see for some it is. Um, this is a map of the world that shows where the more rapidly aging, aging population is situated. And you can see, and in particular, my country, Italy, has one of the highest concentration of elderly people. Uh, in 2015, it's 22.4% per, uh, of the population that is, over, um, that is over 65. In 2100, it will be 34.3%. So we're talking about a third of the population. Greece is similar. Same thing for Singapore and for Japan. And mind you, Greece, Italy, and Japan are three of the places where you have those blue zones, you know, with people that are living to be far older than 100 years. So it's fascinating. These are the most rapidly aging countries. Um, also here you can see in the United States, the percentage of people 65 years old and older by state. And you know, in Florida, it's only 19%. Frankly, I thought it would be more, quite interesting. And it's not. And instead, you know, see, it's not that different from, you know, even uh, California where it's 13%. No matter what, you see that the percentages are quite high. And, uh, um, oh, sorry, I didn't look at this. And the Center for Urban Future has been talking also about a very important fact. Aging is not just a matter of years on, under your belt. Um, the situation of elderly people is also really dictated by their sociological and financial conditions. And it so happens that in New York City, 46% of the city's older adult population is made of immigrants that are often in more complicated and vulnerable situation than, um, than people that are New Yorkers born and bred and that have the kind of infrastructure and structure that can help them as citizens. Once again, go back to these slides and just spend an hour with each uh, after they are online. But this is one of the most beautiful slides. There's this great book that came out two years ago by Dean Simpson that's called Young Old that studies uh, utopias in the future of the uh, urban utopias or the myths about old, getting old in cities. And it's filled with amazing infographics and also with a lot of interesting data and narration. But these infographics, these pyramids are very interesting. They're a little hard for you to see from far away, but um, for instance, here I have a laser. So let's say this is England. 
In the 1950s, people were uh, born here and then got to 65, and you can see that the population got rapidly dwindling around 65 years of age. And instead, right now, it's a much more top-heavy pyramid because people get to live much longer. You can see that Latin America and the Caribbean have one of the biggest changes between 1950 and 2050. It used to be that the population started younger and rapidly dwindled, so a median uh, age or the death age was around uh, 50 in a way, while right now it's also more top-heavy. And the third part of these pyramids measures the lost youth and the gained old age in a way that happened over 50 years in those particular countries. I love how visualization design can help us read so much in data and this is one of the ways. The uh, demographic transition model that was developed by Warren Thompson in 1929 says it all. Of course, there is a, a transition that shows that from the pre-modern to the post-industrial era, the life expectancy has, has become much higher. You can see it here. This is life expectancy, expectancy while the blue line is the crude birth rate and the red line is the crude death rate. So you see in stage one and stage two in the pre-modern era and in the urbanizing and industrializing era, it was a matter of technology advancing, but after that, it really became culture because also the birth rate started to lower. So people have started making fewer children, getting older because of technology, but also choosing to have fewer children. So the birth rates also plummeted together with the death rates, very interestingly. Another um, graph that is in the same book shows how different types of, urban, of human progress have helped people get older better. Urbanism, technology, politics and society, medical care, all of these different aspects contribute to enabling us to live longer. Bernice Newgarten, however, was the first in 1975 to talk about new phases in old age. She was a psychologist, much beloved by all of our speakers, who all suggested her, her writing, so it's quite fascinating, but she really talked about the fact that one doesn't just get old. There are different phases also in old age that are brought about by the fact that we get older and that we also have uh, different ways to live and different places to live. Uh, I really recommend that you read, it's, in the, it's actually in the reading list, but this is a particularly interesting reading. The um, MIT Old Age Lab talks about this, uh, what is it called, Erica? It's the longevity economy, it's called. So this whole sleuth of products that are actually targeted at older people, not only products, but also entities and institutions. For instance, we have the idea of exercise, all the different health um, uh, journalism that exists for all elderly people. This was uh, the illustration that went with that particular article in 2017 about exercise for elderly people. Then, of course, we have also infographics of any kind, live smarter now to live better forever, all the different things that we have to do to age better, the kind of exercise exercise, the ways uh, we have to live and eat. There are consulting companies that are just popping up from all sides to help comp companies, corporations, institutions deal with elderly people. And also there are uh, clubs, like there are social and travel clubs that are only for the elderly, that kind of get rid of the young people that would be disrupting, and there's very interesting reasons why, we'll talk about it later. Uh, there are also alliances for aging research, all kinds of, a, of research entities and institution, and as I mentioned before, there's the MIT Age Lab that gathers uh, scholars of all kinds and scientists and architects to study the impact of old age. Um, interestingly, old age is uh, not all that it's uh, made to be. You know, many people talk about a golden age of old age, like in the past there were fewer older people because people died younger and therefore those older people were cherished and beloved. Well, in truth, we've seen both in mythology and history that it was not truly that way. 
and that loneliness was a problem then as it is now. One of the interesting statistics that we found in the research is that loneliness in terms of living alone is, is different from feeling lonely. Um, at the beginning of the 20th century in England, 9% of the population above 60 lived on its own and along the century it grew to be about 35%. But what was discovered is that very often it was a choice and not um, a, a sad destiny. Of course, this isn't a generalization, as often happens with statistics, but it's an interesting one. Um, Erica, who's the research assistant for R&D, is Milanese, as am I, so we have a lot of Milanese inflections. That is actually the poor um, old people hostel of Milan in a painting from the beginning of the 20th century. Very, very sad. Um, but also, the idea of old age has often intersected with sexism, as we all know. So ageism and sexism together are also a very fascinating study to make. So you see this uh, cover of Life from 1926 that shows an old guy dancing with a very young flapper. You would never see the opposite, especially at that time. And those two interesting pyramids that are from 18... 1835, many things, show the life of uh, an age of a woman and the life and age of a man. The top of the pyramid for the man is 50, for the woman is 30. And at the beginning and at the end of the life of a man, there is a woman taking care of him. So it's really quite fascinating. This, you know, Erica, good job finding all this. Um, Similarly, talking about ageism and sexism, there's also, you know, Giorgione, the three ages of man, 1500 to 1501. The old guy is, you know, he's marked, he has a few wrinkles, but hey, he's still pretty handsome, good looking, he's lost a few hair, but we can deal with him. Look here at Hans Baldung uh, and women. She's really young here, she's, you know, young and still pretty here, and then she gets old and mean, and she's like falling apart, and she's jealous and envious. She has this terrible look in her face, and the same happens with Klimt. The Three Ages of Woman is the title of that painting from 1905. So once again, there's a difference getting old as a man or as a woman. Um, another very interesting myth that we would like to deal with is the myth of the old geezer that wants to like steal all the social security and not leave anything for the generations to come. And it's interesting to think of how the concept of pension really revolutionized our world. Germany, Denmark, and New Zealand were the first countries to, in, to introduce pension. Um, Germany and Denmark in the 19th century, I think also New Zealand, but anyway, very early on. And other countries caught up afterwards. But the concept of pension really was a big revolution that uh, introduced this idea of a third age, at least in Italy. In Italy, we call it the third age, and, uh, um, and it's there are many studies that are really based on the fact that it's after you retire. The silver tsunami is a way to talk about this danger, the old people's danger. Business will have to learn how to ma manage an aging workforce. This is The Economist. And then we have here the taxing problem due to an aging population, why states are in for a financial squeeze as their residents get older. This, as we know, as all of you that deal with economics know very well that there's many ways to look at a situation from different sides, but it's funny how it's always seen from this particular side. Um, America's government is getting old, which this is true. I mean, it's kind of true, but I don't think it's age that is the issue really, but um, it really is, it's a, it's maybe, maybe it's a mental age. Um, and then the enduring myth of the greedy geezer, the press too easily accepts the young versus old frame on the social security debate. So so we take so many things for granted and we take a lot of viewpoints as the, um, as the official ones, but it's not necessarily true. What is very fascinating is that a whole new world is opening up to us because of old age. Um, Erica found this beautiful work by Andy Schmidt that is representing these Tel Aviv grannies. These are women that fled Nazi camps, that had a really tough life, that finally made it to Israel and want to have fun. And she made pictures of this Tel Aviv grannies, this, the, we really like the one on the left, that's a prosthesis left on a chair because she went for a bath in the sea, you know, and so, so she went for a swim and the prosthesis is there. But it's basically really uh, all of a sudden finding a youth that was stolen by history and uh, being able to live another type of life with different cycles and different sinusoids. 
I was telling you before how uh, very often communities that are made for old people uh, kind of do without young people. So in many communities in Florida, there's only, there's a quota for young people because you don't want to have a reminder or a term of comparison that shows you how old or young you are. So they are actually uh, stipulated in the contract and the whole design of the whole communities is made around this idea. Uh, fascinating also how golf carts are used both in Arizona and in Florida a lot because they do not need uh, a driver's license. So they might not be used at all in golf, in golf courses, but they are used as a means of transportation. So there's this whole way of living that is organized around it, as is a whole way of changing body parts and keeping, um, and keeping the physiognomy going. These are only some examples, and I don't have to repeat them or to list them here, but technology and medical uh, development and process and progress really help. Um, in Japan, uh, the, um, the, the metal is double-faced, as in many parts of the world, but especially in Japan. I don't know how many of you saw that uh, heartbreaking article that was in the New York Times just a few months ago that talked about how many um, decomposing bodies have been found in these housing complexes in Japan because some of these uh, elderly are so alone that nobody even notices that they die. But at the same time, there's a whole uh, technological apparatus that is being put in place to help some elderly people with their loneliness. And the Paro Paro, which is that little seal robot, was actually introduced many years ago. It was one of the first um, uh, robots for company that were introduced at the time of the Aibo Sony dog. And of course, uh, this whole idea of how to grow old and not being old and not being alone, I'm sorry, is something that is discussed in Being Mortal, the Atul Gawande book that came out last year. Uh, in the middle, since Erica is a sadist, she put that Visconti mention of that Visconti movie Umberto Di that has always broken my heart because it's really the portrayal of, uh, of the kind of old age that we all fear and the loneliness and destitution. I was talking with you before about the idea of blue zones, however. So Japan is one of these blue zones where people grow old, uh, older than 100. You see that lady there, she died that year at age 116. Over here is Sardinia, which is where I was born, excuse me. And then we have also places in Costa Rica, in the United States, in Loma Linda, and also in Okinawa, Japan. Uh, what is important about these old ages, because so many have been trying to understand what the secret is, what one finds really is that there's many different uh, chemical or, or physiological tricks, you know, moderate regular physical activity, stress reduction. Some have a special honey in Greece. In Sardinia, there's the fava beans. Who knows? But what is really important is the engagement in family life and in social life. What's been discovered is that the places where people live the longer are the places where generations are mixed, where there's a very rich social life that involves both young and old. There's been experiments of putting retirement areas next to kindergartens in, the, in Scandinavia that really have been successful, but it's the idea of purpose and the idea of being part of life that really makes people carry on in these blue zones. Uh, in other words, old age is, of course, a reality. It is physiological. We're not going to make it painted gold and pretend it doesn't exist. It is a process that we can't uh, yet and maybe we don't want to stop. But still, it's also a mental concept. I mean, if you're lucky enough as to have a body that holds you up, it's also a mental idea. And you can see it here. Here, this is something that we found in, on Instagram the other day. And this is also, uh, what's the name of that Instagram feed? Advanced uh, sorry? Advanced style. Advanced style. Thank you very much. I can remember. Advanced style is really a great Instagram feed. But this is a painting from 1794. And uh, actually, we magnified this detail to show how the liveliness is there, present. And it's not about old age mentally and psychologically. It's only the physical part that might lead to desire. 
Uh, Simone de Beauvoir was the first to include age together with gender and race as otherness. It's very interesting. It was a very important concept because it, it leads us to talk about discrimination and to talk about ageism. And to this day, there are people like this uh, weird guy over there, Anthony de... Um, uh, yeah, yeah, Anthony de Grey that talks about aging as an illness, you know, and also there's still this concept, and it's very funny because when Erica showed me this picture, I took it as saying, oh yeah, raisins are great, it's a way to, you know, so you're showing me that older is better, and she said, well, that was not really the meaning of the picture. So it's fascinating because once again, you can see things differently. Here at MoMA, there's a wonderful, wonderful initiative by the education department, especially by Francesca Rosenberg. Francesca, are you here? Yay, there you are. And uh, um, there's a, a lot. We have a, a very important initiative in uh, art therapy, and we deal a lot with Alzheimer. But even without Alzheimer, just letting people express themselves also through age as a celebration of creativity and aging is something that happens here at the museum. And art, you know, we, we wanted to remind how art is always important in understanding how the world lives. This is the work of Maria Lai. It's a fabulous, fabulous piece that is called Legacia la Montaña, which means tie ourselves to the mountain. It was carried out in the village of Ulasai in Sardinia, where there are very old people and very young people. And the task was to tie the whole village and pass this rope around a mountain. You can imagine, it took the whole population. It took children, it took elderly, and also it took a village. Sorry for the platitude, but um, as, uh, as we were studying it, we realized that there were some families that were resistant, and in a way, the passage of the blue thread in their, uh, in their property became a division as opposed to a connection to the rest of the village. So this is really a wonderful metaphor uh, for living together of all kinds and uh, a beautiful work that we decided to use as the symbol, as the icon for our, um, for our salon tonight. Empathy is what is important and necessary. And sometimes empathy is not only narration, it's also really testing physically what it means to be, uh, to be elderly. Patricia Moore, Pat Moore, uh, was very famous in the 1990s. She was a designer based in Texas who had shown how in order to really feel how you are when you're aging, you need to really try and put yourself in the conditions of being an elderly person. So she weighed herself up and down and uh, provoked pain in her, in her bones. Um, you can do it also in uh, high-tech methods. So this is a, a Genworth R70i uh, overall suit that um, an insurance company uses to help people simulate what it means to be aging. But once again, there's nothing wrong in it. If you are in good health and you can walk uh, and you can be yourself, there are so many examples of old age icons. Of course, we always bring up Carmen. Carmen is always like the icon, Carmen de Lorefice, and so is Iris Apfel. Huh? And Anna Magnani. Well, Anna Magnani is here because she famously told her makeup artist, don't you touch my wrinkles. It took me a lifetime to get them, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and Dapper Dan, who was here just last week, and I always like, I, I mock him, I tell him he's like Jaja Gabor because nobody can find out when he was born. But, you know, so it really is quite fascinating to see how there's a whole uh, life of elegance and beauty and potential. And tonight we're going to talk about all this with our great speakers. We're going to start with Bethann Hardison, who is a great model, a supermodel turned entrepreneur, and who also started her own agency called Diversity Coalition that is about exposing and fighting racism and discrimination in the fashion world. Second will come Carly Dixon. Here she is. She's a wonderful architect and she's a fellow of the Harvard Graduate School of Design and this year's recipient, well, you know, I have to wear my glasses, uh, and, and this year's recipient of the Paul Katz Fellowship. She um, studies how cities and buildings and objects can be adapted for aging population. And she will elaborate on the barriers and opportunities that different built environment face in designing, in being designed for older adults. And also she'll show how designing in an age-friendly manner can be beneficial to society at large, which is a very important point. 
Then we'll have Liz Agbertabi, who is the Associate Director of the City Relationships at 100 Resilient Cities. She studies cities all over the world, and she worked with many NGOs to talk about vulnerabilities in different cultures, especially in Africa. Did I say it well? Yes. Um, then will come Linda Mary Montano, who is really a germinal figure in the feminist art and a great performance artist. She will talk about how age has affected her own practice and her own creative process. And uh, as an artist who oftentimes challenges the existence of strict conceptual binaries, Linda will talk about how the aging body has the potential to become a powerful source of artistic inspiration. Last but not least, we'll have Ashton Applewhite, who is a great activist, the leading spokesperson for a movement to mobilize against discrimination on the basis of age. Oh yeah. And uh, she's a blogger, she's a writer, and more than anything, she is an amazing spokesperson. She will talk about how discrimination and prejudice on the ground of a person's age are rooted in the negative messages about late life that bombard us from the media and popular culture. And she will describe ageism as a perfect target for collective advocacy, and we love that. So we're gonna start now with Bethan. Please come to the stage. <laughs> Do you need that slide thingy? Yay. Oh, I don't know. I, you don't have to, oh, perfect. No, no, no. Please. All right. It's hard enough to even. Hello, everyone. Before I start, I want to say Hello. one thing is that I, I was very impressed this evening because I came earlier to see the show uh, is Fashion Martin, and uh, it's really quite brilliant. If anybody hasn't seen it, please see it <laughs> <Thank> because <you. laughs> it not, I'm not trying to, uh, no, but it's brilliant. It. <laughs> and the Thank reason you. why I had to, I'm happy that I saw it is because I have this habit of uh, not being happy with an industry that I'm sort of associated to, sort of turned off to it, and it could be because of my age. It could be because of the time that I've spent in it. I grew up in the garment district, um, and when we grew up in the garment district in that time period, we never even talked about the word fashion. It was just uh, the apparel business, and that's what we did. But to talk about age and fashion, it seems interesting to me that we can often say that, well, designers, they come up and they start out young and they wind up pretty old and they can die doing their craft. And surely retail executives can start middle age and because they have to have a certain amount of experience and then they can wind up dying with their craft. But when it comes down to the fashion model, oftentimes there's a limit. And many times people say, well, when do you think it's time for them to stop? I mean, how old do you think you can go? So we start at 13 sometimes. Sometimes we start at nine. I mean, Brooks Shields started at nine. And then sometimes you can go for a long period of time. But oftentimes it is said that the man, the male model, can go much longer because it's, it's a maturity. Because back in the day, you know, men looked at the male, the grown up, the mature man, to decide what he was going to wear or what he should look good in. Are you all looking at things? Would you look at me? <laughs> Help me out here. Uh, okay, yeah, well, that, that's when I was really young. Um, <laughs> but so what winds up happening is when it comes down to the female model. The female model oftentimes is thought like she can, have to, she can only go but so long. She can't, you know, she really should end up a little earlier because it's a, we think sometimes in the past that, you know, fashion was all about a youthful glow or maybe it was just about a glow. Well, now it's become quite different. Now it's a lot of young, youthful models on the runway, youthful boys for sure, representing men's clothing, and youthful girls always represented the apparel world because the apparel world really was based mostly on the women. So now we have this situation where I, who always fought for what we call diversity, and diversity usually in most companies as well in fashion, was always about race. Well, I wanted to change what had begun to be a downside because at one given point, the fashion model of color, whether she be a female or a male, had begun to disappear off the runway, off the pages of magazines, and it disturbed me because I was a, a runway model. I worked in design coming up in the garment district. But now as time has gone by, and I've surely helped to change that and made things a little bit better, now it seems that Diversity includes many things. It could be bodies, it could be age, it could be young, it could be old, 
and people were very concerned about where is the fashion model that represents me? Where's the fashion model that represents my size, my age? Where is she? Well, I've always thought to myself, if you're still a fashion model at the age of 30, 40, 50, 60, something's wrong. You need to move on. There's a life, and that's why <laughs> most fashion models don't sort of hang around waiting for someone to call them for a job. What winds up happening usually is if you still have that body alignment, that good old DNA, and you still look great, and you can easily fit the sample size, surely you have a life, but a designer may call you and ask you to please join on the runway or in a magazine. And it still represents their inspiration. But what I'm beginning to find out as I'm living amongst the millenniums and all the young people who really are fighting for so many different things, and now that fashion has sort of been embraced by popular culture, popular culture seems to say and determine what we should be doing in fashion, which was always the opposite. Usually we, or the fashion industry, projected and the audience was inspired. And now what seems to happen is that popular culture says, I want, and fashion is so in need of support, they say, okay, let me do that to sort of like support my market. I honestly have never been the person who, growing up in a kid in Brooklyn, Bedford-Stuyvesant, or any place ever needed to have any of my self-reflection shown anywhere to make me feel better about myself. But it seems to be the day has come that everyone seems to say, where am I? Peace out. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> I want to start off with a big, big thank you to Paola, Erica, and the MoMA for inviting me to speak alongside these inspiring women. I've been very fortunate to have had the opportunity to continue my thesis research from Harvard Graduate School of Design in London this past fall as the KPF Paul Katz Fellow. So I guess you could call me an architectural design researcher focused on intergenerational environments. To, ser to share my research, I'll take you through some of the questions and potential opportunities I've encountered so far, with a little background about me to start. My work is motivated by people I love. Seeing my strong and graceful grandma respond so acutely to the spaces around her, even as her Alzheimer's worsened, and then later learning from the wise and vibrant 90-something-year-old couple, Gerald and Nina Holton at Harvard, caused me to wonder why we rarely design places that are physically accessible, socially accessible, and awesome all at the same time. I started wondering how I can create places where older people are integrated rather than isolated from society, spaces that all ages can enjoy. I started to see that in addition to the moral, social, and personal reasons to care about our aging world, the demographic forecast alone should motivate action. The population shifts will impact people as consumers, workers, carers, and citizens. And by the end of the century, 90% of us, young and old, will live in cities. Where and how are all of these people going to live? We need to think about where we will live and where we will find meaningful relationships at the same time so that we don't have to compromise one for the other. Studies have shown that loneliness carries a health risk comparable to smoking 15 cigarettes a day, but befriending schemes are often targeted solely at older adults, when loneliness is a problem for all ages. By acknowledging that this is an ageless issue, we can create intergenerational spaces that enable social interactions, from informal chance encounters to formalized programming. My research on such spaces formally kicked off in Paola's seminar at Harvard, where I interviewed influential age-related professionals, such as Jeremy Meyerson, curator of the New Old exhibition, specific, when he was um, looking at reimagining old age, specifically in a North American and UK context where old currently carries negative connotations. And when I refer to old, I'm not ubiquitously referring to all those 65 plus that happen to have reached an outdated retirement age, but rather the physical, mental, and experiential effects associated with older age that may be felt at 45, 65, or 105, depending on the person. My work aims to embrace the unique and variable futures we each face and celebrate aging as a universal condition that we all share. While working at the MIT Age Lab, I began to investigate age-friendly city guidelines. The World Health Organization consolidated findings from older adults and care providers around the world into a guide with universal themes in this pragmatic checklist. While the age-friendly approach is well-intentioned and highlights many important considerations, I started to see a common trend of focusing on minimum standards, self-limiting checklists, 
physical requirements and solely quantitative measures rather than people's qualitative desires. So while the age-friendly guide can be a useful reference for certain aspects of our future cities, I think it provokes critical and productive questions about the potential gaps in our design process associated with older adults. The term age-friendly means friendly for all ages, whether you're 8 or 80, but the guide focuses on older adults as a siloed demographic, and the language in the guide focuses on physical accessibility requirements, proliferating the unproductive narrative that older adults are only needy consumers of help and support, rather than the reality that they're a wildly diverse group with many needs and desires, plus a wealth of value and life experience. So we see that environments for older adults are currently associated with the narrow definition of accessibility, often assuming physical disability, like bringing, bringing, um, likely bringing to mind images of yellow warning tape or ramps tacked on at the end. But if we reframe access to, so that we think of our physical abilities and consider social access and experiential access as equally important parts of the equation, we could design more engaging environments. And when I say social access, I'm really thinking about social dimensions and third things. Social dimensions refer to a space that's big or small enough to make strangers feel comfortable together. And third things refer to that thing that can catalyze a shared experience, like admiring the same sculpture or waiting in the same line. And experiential access refers to how it's not enough to just be welcome, you need to know you're welcome. And this goes beyond signage. What are the visual, circulatory, and other experiential cues that let you know you're welcome? So the access trifecta fills out more of Maslow's pyramid, and designing this way has a better shot of being enjoyed by people no matter their age. So rather than feeling like we have to compromise between accessible and bland, or engaging and inaccessible, we can take this on as a dynamic design challenge to reach the engaging and accessible corner instead. And while environments for older adults often rep represent a compromised future, we can see desirable age neutrality in other design fields, the car industry designed specifically for 55 plus users that account for 42% of their sales. But yet these are not beige products with beige advertising. They're designed to be appealing for all. And similarly, my 90 year old friend Maggie from the Age Labs Lifestyle Leaders shared a list of the attributes of her iPad with me. And everything listed was not only beneficial to older adults, but to all ages. So if designers stop stereotyping older adults and instead embed age inclusivity into architecture and urban design, it could lead over time to perception shifts, reframing our expectations of later life. My favorite example of the influence of expectations is psychologist Ellen Langer's counterclockwise study. She had older adults live in a retreat for a week where they spoke in present tense as if they were their 20-year-old selves. They measured their mental health, physical ability, and, and cognitive abilities before and after, and found that everything improved exponentially, even their eyesight and their memory. So <laughs> we can reframe the benefits of accessible environments as well. Right now, the design process has accessibility standards that look like this, showing us when a ramp is required. But if we can demonstrate the many situations where the ramp is required, desired, or both, we can see how designing with older adults in mind benefits people of all ages and abilities. We see it with these grand rent entrance ramps at the VNA, where they're also the experiential cue that let us know all are welcome here. And we see it with this ramp in Oslo, not as a secondary route, but as the destination in itself. And we see it in this community center in Sao Paulo, one of many intergenerational spaces in Brazil, a country where ages are more integrated culturally. These ramps are, are steeper than codes would allow here. Ramps are getting ever shallower in our risk and liability-centric context suggesting that support is more important than challenge or engagement or play. And maybe it is, but I think it's worth questioning, and I think it's worth asking what we can learn from places like Brazil. So you can see it's no secret that I love ramps. And, <laughs> and it started with this one in particular. This ramp is playful, intriguing, poetic, and pragmatic all at once. It frees your eyes from the ground as it reveals the world before you. It represents democratic access for all. It's the reason I associate accessibility with magical, hopeful places, rather than with this. I realize this is the world access is perceived to live in. Between policies, checklists, regulations, standards, statements, reports, and supplementary guides, I can understand why it's difficult for designers to access access, to get excited about it, to visualize how these dense rules can catalyze engaging, enabling environments, rather than prescribed, constrained ones. If we can clarify where designers have room to play, we might reveal more creative ways to make environments that go beyond the bare minimum. We can show how physical access goes beyond safety and support. It can be about physical play that can lead to social access. And we can see how physical access 
as being challenged in a positive way, like this park that challenges all ages to reorient perceptions and discover the possibilities of the body. And we can see how social access can lead to intergenerational encounters through London's Barbican Housing Complex and Arts Centre. At the Barbican um, is a public plaza where people of all ages gather. If you prefer a backrest, you have five seating choices. If you require or prefer something to push off of out of your seat, you can choose from three types. If you're in a wheelchair, you can pull comfortably into three spots. If you'd prefer to face a view, you can sit in five areas. If you'd like to potentially chat to someone, you have a table and bench dimensions that support this by allowing for a human-sized space in between so you can com so comfortably sit with strangers. So whether you came to enjoy your lunch, the view, a book, a rest, or a chat, the physical and social access dimensions enable it. Then if you add a third thing, and for the Barbican, maybe it's that pigeon trying to eat your sandwich, you have an excuse for interaction. This camaraderie could be enough to make someone's day. Plus, benefits like someone watching your items while you go to the loo allow you to, space, to stay in the space for longer. Maybe you return more often, maybe you consume more, maybe you feel more invested in maintaining the space or participating in the community, ultimately benefiting all the stakeholders involved. So looking at the process for getting to this place, we don't see the checklist or the code. We see the qualitative subjective experience through sketches and perspectives. So to show a quick snapshot of what I'm working on, I'm interested in how we can merge the poetic and the pragmatic, making the process for designing accessible intergenerational environments one that's more playful, thoughtful, and intentional, where the physical, social, and experiential access dimensions and qualities are embedded into the project at the beginning to generate provocations for a new future of aging, rather than being tacked on at the end. And we can imagine that a shift in our process can lead to changes in outcomes, where we don't choose between these qualities as either or scenario, but rather embrace the complexity of the city and consider how physical, social, and experiential access can integrate all of these qualities so we don't have to compromise. Then we could imagine how these shifts over time may lead to thinking about accessibility not as prescribed afterthought, but as creative forethoughts, not as warning signs, but as welcome signs, ultimately taking us away from ages silos towards meaningful intergenerational relationships. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. So, super excited to be here this evening and to speak with you about new aging. Um, and I'd like to talk to you about new aging in the African context. So, where I come from, which is Cameroon uh, in West Africa, um, we've always ascribed very positive attributes and qualities um, to older members of our society. Um, there's an honor in being gray and, and older and, and wrinkled and being distinguished. Um, and sometimes even if you're chronologically young, it behooves you to look older. It's much more impressive uh, to be um, accomplished and older than it is to be accomplished and younger. Um, and so this conversation for me is particularly interesting um, because when we talk about um, aging, we typically talk about the Eurocentric or Global North perspective. Um, and the perspective from Africa is quite different. Um, so of course, in the Global North, it's great. Everyone wants to be young and relevant. Um, there's a dominant discourse on aging. There's also elder abuse and age discrimination. In the African context, of course, everyone wants to be young and also relevant. Uh, there's discourse on ageism and aging stereotypes. Um, but there's also reverse ageism. And there's very limited literature or discussion, really, on what reverse ageism is and the implications um, in the society. Historically in Africa, few people lived beyond 50 years old. To be 60 years old, you were an elder. To be 80 years old or more, you were an anomaly. Most people uh, lived in predominantly rural settings. Intergenerational dwellings were common. So younger people living with uh, grandparents or parents um, and being able to provide care for them was common and expected. How dare you not care for your mom or grandmom or elderly relative? Um, 
And how dare you be disrespectful uh, to your relatives if they uh, lived with you. Um, in fact, to be dis disrespectful or, or not care for um, your elderly uh, relatives was buying yourself uh, eternal damnation. Historically, elders were perceived as mediators between the current world and the new world. If you expected to live a happy life in the afterlife, you better be good to your elders. Um, they were representatives of uh, our ancestors and creators, um, custodians of our culture, heritage, and tradition. You, they were certainly cared for by uh, younger generations, um, and they'd earned their rightful place in society. So if you lived long enough to be elderly, it was a badge of honor, and you deserve to live well. Um, of course, um, in many of our languages and our cultural uh, practices, um, we reinforce uh, this uh, concept of, of being elderly as being something positive. Um, and so in my language, um, uh, in Cameroon, um, to be elderly, um, there are titles that are bestowed upon you, titles of respect. Um, there are ways in which you behave around older people. Um, so someone my age would never look an older person in the eyes, so avoid eye contact. Um, if I was seated next to someone older, I couldn't sit with my legs crossed. That would be considered disrespectful. Um, and if I was speaking to someone who was older, um, I'd never refer to them by their first name. And so we have a running joke um, in my culture because everyone ultimately is your auntie or your uncle um, because you don't call anyone by their first name. So of course Africa is shifting. Um, and again, not to speak of Africa as a uh, homogenous culture or people. Um, I, I have had the good fortune of, of being able to uh, work and, and live um, across the continent. And so I'm approaching this with um, the experiences that, that I've had. Um, but you know, now elders are respected, not necessarily revered as they uh, historically were. Um, there's the emergence of elder segmentation. So there's young elders and older elders, and everyone wants to, desires to be a young elder. Um, and so um, being, a, being older chronologically and uh, physiologically looking younger is something that now um, there's more of a value uh, placed on, which historically didn't really exist. You were just happy that you lived beyond 50 years old. And uh, now there's also a positive outlook on, on aging. Uh, people can live longer. People can live better. Um, and so it's not as scary. Um, people continue to work well into uh, their uh, 60s and 70s. Um, there's also workforce dominance, both in the formal and the informal um, sector um, in Africa. Um, if you live longer, uh, there are better chances of, of um, promotions of uh, growing in your, in your field of expertise. Um, and you can always sort of look down on the younger people as inexperienced newbies who are sort of just coming in and have a lot to learn. So there's actually quite an advantage to being older, being wiser, being mature, being knowledgeable. Of course, now there's, uh, in Africa, with uh, innovation around public health and the eradication of infectious diseases, uh, people are living longer. Um, but also, uh, people are, are now facing uh, the challenges uh, that the West has historically faced uh, related to living longer, living longer but not necessarily healthy. Um, with globalization, our, our nations are, are so well connected and what happens in one nation ultimately uh, impacts or influences the others. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of embracing of Western ideals as well. So uh, the anti-wrinkle uh, creams are everywhere um, and Botox and everything that you can imagine um, in the West. Um, religion also. So historically, we saw our ancestors as our connectors to our gods. Um, but now with the rise of uh, Christianity, there's the prosperity gospel, and um, which there's no longer uh, much uh, belief in, in sort of the, an the ancestors, the powers of the ancestors. Um, and then, of course, what I think is uh, one of the biggest uh, shifts is uh, urbanization. 
So Africa is the most rapidly urbanizing uh, region, um, unparalleled. Um, and in Africa, cities are the future. So currently about 54% of the global population lives in cities. Um, you can probably tell I'm quite passionate about cities. Um, I, I, uh, my work uh, focuses on cities. Um, but currently, um, the, world, the world is urbanizing, of course, and people are moving to cities. And, and why they're moving to cities, I think, is something that we all um, know quite well. People are moving to cities as places of innovation, places of opportunity, um, and places of uh, connectivity also. And that's not any different in Africa um, than it is across the world. Um, but I think it's especially um, more so in Africa. Um, in, excuse me. I think it's especially true in Africa um, because this is a moment um, of opportunity that most people have not had um, historically. And so when you think about the drivers uh, for this shift, economic, uh, conveniences, um, social connection, et cetera, we see that most cities, uh, these are some of the leading uh, rapidly urbanizing cities in Africa, are anticipating an increase in their population of over uh, 80%. Uh, a few of the cities that are rapidly urbanizing um, across the region and um, Dar es Salaam, this is Lagos. Um, this is the uh, famous bridge that, uh, that Mark Zuckerberg uh, ran across in Lagos. This is Cairo. And here, just looking at the demographic uh, shifts uh, in Africa versus Europe, um, you can see that Africa's uh, demographic skew significantly uh, younger. So 40% of the population currently is below 19 years old um, in Africa as compared to some of the other regions which we talked about earlier. So of course, this is a young continent, a continent of opportunity. Um, nonetheless, it's a continent that's governed by some of the world's oldest leaders and there are implications um, for this. And Africa is certainly um, urbanizing, our cities are urbanizing and our demographics are shifting, but it's also within the context of an aging planet uh, with physical, social, and economic vulnerabilities. Um, we talked earlier about uh, ageism and uh, sexism. You certainly see this in Africa, uh, where women and the young are disproportionately impacted in uh, all of these areas. Some of our uh, governance systems uh, and the lack of social uh, safety nets um, and pro-youth provisions also are, uh, confound uh, the impacts of aging. Um, and nonetheless, it's not all a bleak um, story. Uh, there are a number of solutions and innovations and, um, that are currently underway to try to improve the outlook uh, for uh, the young in Africa. Um, so today, what, I, what I'd like to urge all of us to consider is as we have uh, this conversation around ageism, um, to also think about uh, the young in Africa and the ageism that they face. Um, and I look forward to uh, an engaging conversation with all of you. Thank you. This is a collaboration, so help me out. Um, thanks to Mama, Paola, Erica, uh, for the invitation, and to my video editor, Toby Carey. We worked together 20 years. Um, the first image is from my new book, 14 Years of Living Art, publishers Adam and Cy Silver, the image by Gisela Gampers, who is in the house. Um, that 14-year endurance allowed me to sculpt and erase time, and as a result, I by bypassed aging via art. My initiation to performance art and aging began at the feet of my grandmother's nan, a wild outsider artist 
who let me stand next to her in silence as she drew primitive stick figures as she sewed on her singer machine, as she quilted, as she made minuscule furniture for aliens from twigs, and as she played her harmonica and then took her teeth out and sang, If I Had the Wings of an Angel. So he, this is a collaboration part. So sing along with me. If I had the wings of an angel over these prison walls, I would fly. I would. Fly. I don't have much time here, so hurry. I would fly to the arms of my darling, and there I would lay me down. Um, my Italian grandmother taught me to age via endurance as she prayed silent rosaries for many hours in memory of my aunt, that little girl there, and her daughter, Eula Montano, who died of the flu at three years in 1918. I watch them both closely and see now that I have been mentored into my own path and am aging just like them, only my language is performance art. Video one, viewer discretion, dystonia. When I developed a chronic neurological illness, cervical dystonia, I immediately made a video to bring this fear, dread, and pain to another level. That is, my video brought illness to the church of art, the altar of art, and alchemized painful truth with the beauty of creativity. Art is my medicine. Dear performance art, you are my therapy, my hospital, my drug of choice, my church, my love. My art helps me recycle trauma. With you, I destroy, transform, and eliminate time, and therefore bypass aging. No time, <laughs> no aging. <laughs> How fabulous. I have rehearsed the consequences of aging and subsequent fear of loss of sight by staying blindfolded for a week many, many times. I now perform, <laughs> um, I now perform as an elder to rehearse aging. Why rehearse? Because I want to be very easy on my CNA and caregivers. My daily life with its traumas and problems has always been food and inspiration for my art. Life gives us prompts for art. For example, if I'm lonely, I make lonely art. Afraid, I make afraid art. That is the recipe. So let's look at uh, other videos. Uh, Mother Teresa. I experimented with persona I have, one on, I have one on intoxication that's fabulous. Um, and in 1976, made a video of myself as famous people. Young people. As I aged, the people became older. Bob Dylan, Paul McMahon, Mother Teresa. Why her? I was walking like Mother Teresa because I have dystonia! <laughs> and so I decided to cash in and make money on my illness and my wrinkles, and I became her. And I always wanted to be a saint. <laughs> Maybe in the process, some of her divine ease would get transferred to me. Um, next, nurse, nurse. My belief is that I must prepare for dementia and Alzheimer's altogether. Dementia. <laughs> And Alzheimer's! Thank you. I might succumb to both, but I don't want to bring my neuroses and angers and rages to AIDS at a nursing home who are taking care of me, feeding me, changing and toileting me, plus 45 other clients while making $8 an hour. I performed in this video as if I were a struggling nursing home client and then allowed for the angel of acceptance to teach me how to receive help from the harried nurse. My art teaches me how to age with dignity. <laughs> Caregiver facts. 43 
8.5 million adult family caregivers care for someone over 50 at home. 14.9 million care at home for family members with Alzheimer's. In two, 2009, 61.6 million people provided unpaid care for the chronically ill. 1.4 million children, 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 8 to 18 cared for adult relatives. <clears throat> Uh, so could you, could you all collaborate and that you can put that on your resume collaboration with um, <laughs> could you could you do the angel of acceptance version of nurse 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 but also practice the other one at home it's very important uh, next next video it won't be long. Have you ever heard of senescence? I think I have. Uh, I'm in my late 70s. Let me tell you about it. Wikipedia says, senescence refers to a scenario when a living being is able to survive all calamities, but eventually dies due to causes relating to old age. Oh. Oh, oh my God. Oh, my God, Toby. The deterioration of cellular activity, the ruination of regular function. I know I look fabulous. I look fabulous. I don't look old. No, you don't. You look fabulous to me. Maybe I won't die, Toby. What do you think? Mm, well, and uh, it's almost up. Your time, that is. But, you know, we all go there. So here's some more information Wikipedia says. Signs of death or strong indications that someone is no longer alive are respiratory arrest, no breathing, that means, or cardiac arrest, no pulse. Am I breathing, Toby? You're breathing and you have a pulse. That's two good things. Okay. The other thing is pallor. Mortis, paleness, which happens in the 15 or 20 minutes after death. Do I look pale to you? No, no, you're robust and rosy cheeks. <laughs> Next I'm video. still breathing. Your, your limbs are all... Um, Toby and I have been working together for 20 years, and uh, working with him, has, working on this video and other videos similar, have allowed me to take aging seriously and also be lighthearted about impermanence, laughter heals. Uh, one, one, two, three, uh, we're going to do ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Benares. My journey to India allowed me to freely look at death and to visit Hindu nursing homes, which were often ashrams for elders who were incorporated prayer and mantra devotions into their last days. I want to retire to a home that is dedicated to spiritual practices. It would look like a monastery but would have a big swimming pool, or might be just like the Dutch experiment titled Dementia Village, a small town modeled on a town square. There I will safely wander freely. I will dance, I will sing, I will laugh, I will swim and eat until I die. One will soon open in San Diego. I use my art to rehearse this possible future. Chickens. My MFA degree in sculpture in 1999 included nine live chickens living in huge conceptual art, male-looking sculptural cages. Uh, then I performed as the chicken woman. This has been going on for 50 years. What does that have to do with aging? In 2011, an experiment was designed in a nursing home in England titled The Hen Power Project. Residents were matched with chickens. <laughs> These pets were then, the pets were then fed by them. Cages were maintained by them. Eggs were collected by them. Chickens were rocked and held by them. The result was miraculous. The program has improved their health, cured depression, and resulted in a new joy and title of Hensioneer. Um, I'll end with a prayer. Could, could you all make beautiful chicken sounds, please? <laughs> Dear Mother God, please, please alert my relatives that I want to be sent to England when that time comes, or buy me a live chicken so I can hold my sweet pet and become a full-fledged Handsome air. Amen. Thank you very much.
In homage, manage a nervous laugh at that word. How does it make you feel? Um, I started writing and thinking about aging because I was afraid of it. And what was my biggest fear? Ending up drooling under a bad Van Gogh print in some grim institutional hallway not designed by Carly. Uh, and then I learned that only 4% of Americans end up in nursing homes. And since I started working on this 10 years ago, that number has declined to 2.5%, which is pretty small. And if you subtract that 25% uh, of uh, Americans over 65 in nursing homes, 90% um, of them can think just fine, right? Alzheimer's is a terrible disease, and the odds do increase with age, but dementia rates are falling significantly. The real epidemic is anxiety over memory loss. So <laughs> what was another assumption I started out with? That old people were depressed because they were old and they were gonna die soon. And it turns out that people are happiest at the beginnings and the ends of their age. And the longer we live, the less we fear dying. This is called the U-curve of happiness, and it's been borne out by dozens of studies in the US and around the world. So I started thinking about why so many people didn't know any of these things. And the reason is because of ageism, treating people differently because of how old we think they are. And we experience it any time someone thinks we're too old for something, a task, a relationship, a haircut, instead of finding out who we are and what we're capable of, or too young, because ageism cuts both ways. And that's because negative messages about late life bombard us from the media and popular culture at every turn. Wrinkles are ugly. Old people are incompetent. It's sad to be old. And we older people can be the most ageist of all because we have had a lifetime to internalize these messages and most of us have never, it's never even occurred to us to challenge them. And I had to acknowledge it and stop colluding. For example, I stopped blaming my sore knee on being 65 because my other knee doesn't hurt and it's just as old. <laughs> All isms, sexism, ageism, homophobia, racism are socially constructed ideas, which is just a fancy way of saying we make them up and they change over time. But they all serve the same purpose, a social and economic purpose, which is to legitimize and sustain inequalities between groups. They're not about how we look. They're about how people in power assign meaning to how we look. We are all worried about some aspect of getting older, whether it's running out of money or getting sick or ending up alone, and those fears are legitimate and real. But the thing that never dawns on most of us is that the experience of getting old or even just reaching middle age or just aging past youth can be better or worse depending on the culture in which it takes place. It is not having a vagina that makes life harder for women. It's sexism. It's not loving a man that makes life harder for gay guys. It's homophobia. And it is not the passage of time that makes aging so much harder. I think particularly hard in the US, but all through the world, especially in the Western developed world. Not, not aging that makes it so much harder. It's not the passage of time, it's ageism. There is no line in the sand, no crossover between old and young, this you know, terrible transition we're all so worried about, after which it's all downhill. And the longer we wait to challenge that idea, the more damage it does to ourselves and to our place in the world. Engineers in Silicon Valley are getting Botoxed and hair plugged before key interviews. And these are skilled white men in their 30s. So imagine the effects further down the food chain. An information society demands the deep knowledge base of older workers. Age is a criterion for diversity, obviously. And yet age discrimination in the workplace is rampant and the personal and economic consequences are devastating. There's a growing body of fascinating research that Paola referred to that shows that attitudes towards aging have an actual measurable effect on how our minds and bodies function. And this is the experiment in which people were sort of time traveled and then, be, and then began their minds and bodies started to work better. People with more positive feelings towards aging work better, heal faster, and live longer. 
And that's why the World Health Organization is developing a global campaign against ageism to extend not just lifespan, but health span. As also has been mentioned by a couple of people before me, ageism, women face the double whammy of ageism and sexism, so we experience getting older differently. And the effects on our health and our income and well-being add up over time. And the effects are further compounded by race and by class, which is why everywhere in the world, the poorest of the poor are old women of color. Age segregation impover impoverishes us because it cuts us away from most of humanity. The exchange of skills and stories across generations is obviously the natural order of things. And in the United States in particular, ageism has subverted it. The problem of uh, end of life is cast in terms of growing numbers of older people who inconveniently refuse to die. When the underlying issue is the changing nature of health care, which defaults to expensive and profitable interventions to prolong life at any cost. At any age and in any condition, people have the right to want to stay alive. An ageist culture frames population aging as a zero-sum proposition in which the old profit at the expense of the young. This is not ethical. We don't allocate resources by race or by sex, and weighing the needs of the old against the young is equally unacceptable. It also fails the common sense test. Olders are not them, they are us, our parents, our neighbors, our spouses, our friends. If society doesn't help support a decent old age, who's gonna end up taking care of our grandparents and us in turn? As Carly talked about, communities that are good to grow old in, which means they have parks and are accessible and have decent public transportation and, and you know, social services are good for everyone. The ramps that she talks about you know, are good for skateboarders and delivery guys. And the same goes for work, workplaces that offer the accessibility and flexibility that older workers need. They are all age friendly. What's the takeaway from that map, which I think we saw in Liz's uh, program also briefly? that the world is getting old fast. By 2050, one in five people worldwide, almost two billion people will be age 60 and up. And longer lives are a fundamental measure of human progress, right? A triumph of public health. All these older people represent a vast, unprecedented, and untapped resource. So here's the R&D challenge. Longer lives are new. Science has leapfrogged culture. The institutions around us were created when lives were shorter, and roles have yet to evolve too. So as thinkers, designers, artists, and activists, we have a critical window of opportunity to help shape a world that supports this new longevity. Aging is not a problem to be fixed or a disease to be cured. It is a natural, powerful, lifelong process that unites us all. So if we want to make the most of longer lives in every arena, from how we feel when we look in the mirror to putting a global human rights issue on the map, we need to work together to raise awareness of ageism and to end it. And until we do, ageism will oppress us all. And just one more thing, why add another ism to the list when so many, racism in particular, in these terrible times, call out for action? Well. Here's the thing, we don't have to choose. Once again, it's not zero sum. Because when we make the world a better place to grow old in, we make it a better place to have a disability, to be from somewhere else, to be queer, to be non-rich, to be non-white. And when we show up at all ages for whatever cause, not just the questions this panel is addressing, but climate change or domestic violence or whatever matters to you, we do two things. We make that effort more effective and we dismantle ageism in the process. That's why all these intergenerational uh, initiatives are so important. That is the natural and organic way to dismantle ageism. Longevity is here to stay. A movement to end ageism is underway. I'm in it, and I hope you'll join me. Thank you. Well, I would like to invite you to sit with me, please. I know that I have that seat. I've been delinquent and I don't know where everyone is sitting, but yeah, we'll, we'll make do also if the microphones are scrambled. But it's been really wonderful to listen to you all. And I want to thank us all for not having mentioned Cocoon. <laughs> this is pretty good to go through it without that. But there's also, I know in the audience, so many people that are working on this same sub subject. And I would like, 
if you don't mind, Francesca, I'm going to put the spotlight on you for a moment, but could you describe the experience of having this initiative of MoMA with the older age and creativity? Is there a microphone that we can throw to Francesca, please? She's up, she's up here. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind standing. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Well, um, first of all, thank you to, to Paola and to Erica and to all the panelists. What an incredible, uh, what incredible presentations and I can't wait to dive into the conversation with you all. Thank you, Paola, for just giving me a minute. Um, we do have this initiative at MoMA. Um, it's relatively new and I'm wearing gloves because I'm very cold, but I'm <laughs> a fashion statement. I realize I'm wearing these gloves. Um, and so the idea is for us to be part of this rethinking um, of, of older age and to, um, to think about it in terms of creativity and connectivity and curiosity. And um, what we do here is we, we also went through a period of research and development working with an advisory board of people ranging in age from um, 62 to 92. And, um, and we found out from them what they wanted. And of course, what, what everybody wants is something different, right? They want. <laughs> um, and so that's what we're trying to provide here. And we're also working with colleagues at um, cultural institutions across the city and also now nationally and internationally um, to be a part of this movement because we really do believe that that culture needs to catch up um, as you so eloquently said. So please look for primetime at MoMA um, offerings online. You can just do a search and find out but we we do offer regular programs here for people who are roughly 65 and up but we also really believe, as you've all said so beautifully, about intergenerational programming, and we want to, to bring younger and older people together as, um, as it's so important. So Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's interesting because you were um, talking about institutions taking part in this changing of the culture, and then um, you just said, Ashton, that science leapfrogged culture, and then Carly briefly spoke about legislation, and Bethan about her area of activism, and we're all doing something, but um, I wonder what comes first. D does legislation come first? I mean, science goes its own way. But how do you make things happen if culture is not ready? Do regulations and legislations help, Carly? I've been interviewing uh, different stakeholders related to the built environment. I've been interviewing different stakeholders in London uh, with related to the built environment and asking that question. And oh. sometimes they say it needs to come from the policy first, and sometimes they say it needs to come from the funder first. And then a lot of them are pointing me towards the grassroots or the bottom-up initiatives too. But I, I feel like it could, if it comes from all directions, like the more the merrier kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We can all all start thinking about. It. But I don't. I don't. I don't know. You don't know yet? Yeah. Do you have, yeah, Ashton, I was about to come to you. Um, culture precedes legislation. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. law, laws are a response to, 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 the people. to the people. That's it. That's also your experience, but then? I, I, I'm, I'm so stunned to, to think about how people, when you, when you talk about, like I'm constantly thinking about, in a good way, about preparing my goodbye. I mean, people, I, I'm raised by a father and a mother, a grandmother who really believed in dying. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they, they, they didn't let you think that you weren't going to do that. That was from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I was eight years old. She was saying, you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say, you know, what, what, you talk about death all the time, but what about life? And she always said to me, my grandmother, she said, I don't know a thing about life, but for sure you're going to die. <laughs> now, this is, a, this is an interesting thing to me because if you come from a place where people raise you to believe in getting older mm -hmm. and you appreciate it. And I have another thing I want to say before we go into someone else is that how women don't just enjoy the life from beginning to end. Like they have a lot of restrictions about what a man should be, how old he should be, how much money he should be. And I keep thinking, why don't you enjoy anybody who just finds you attractive? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Why don't you just involve yourself? So I think it starts like when you say about culture, it starts from people. If we just relax and enjoy it to the end, live to be, instead of trying to figure out, you know, like you said, I have never thought with the injuries I have now that it comes from age. 
I always think it's come from the fact that I've worked very hard to gain it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It didn't rust out. <laughs> yeah. It's funny how grandmothers hold quite a special place in this panel, because also your grandmother, yeah. Linda, was that your grandmother was the outsider artist? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm also thinking about people like Carolee Schneeman and By the Judith way, we have, Bernstein. we have an exhibition about, of Carolee's work at Joan Mama Jonas, PS1. Louise yeah. Bourgeois, and people who Bourgeois. really yeah. mentored, who, what's your name, George O'Keefe, yeah. who yeah. really mentored It's Okay, and, and yeah, really fought, you. and yeah. uh, fought's the wrong word. Mm -hmm. uh, Exhibited. Thank you. Yeah. The, uh, an incredible, beautiful, beautiful stand-up Yes. Yeah. And uh, well, yeah, my grandmothers were great teachers. By the way, uh, there's no man in the panel tonight, not because of sexism, just the few that I invited were not available. So I just wanted to know, didn't do it on purpose, you know? I'd actually like us, I'd like to invite us to challenge that yeah. notion, actually, that culture over legislation Good. Um, and yeah. that order. Um, I think that there's a risk of the dominant culture not necessarily being the right culture. So think about our nation today and think about um, our current culture um, and some of the legislation which contributes uh, to that. And so I think there are instances where we should think legislation and then culture. Well, we hope. We hope, we, we hope culture. that That's the it. culture yeah, supports so. legislation that, that is inclusive. Yeah, Liz has a point. Sometimes it takes a little push. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we need, the people. I mean, if you look at the position of women in society 50 years ago, what was the main thing that provoked, you know, where we are today? Yep. I mean, Agreed. Me Too yep. and mm -hmm. all the bad stuff but also, yep. but, you know, was the women's movement, a yep. broad-based social movement sure. that showed people that what they thought were personal problems, mm -hmm. were in fact widely shared political problems that required collective action. And the same thing with the civil rights movement. Well, I was about to ask you, it's really interesting, you, know, you were saying how you started the diversity coalition thinking about race and maybe gender, and then age became also part of the equation, and the same thing that Simone de Beauvoir was saying. So it's different forms of, uh, uh, of, of activism that nonetheless join each other and learn from each other. So what's the right kind of activism? What are great example of uh, actions that, that rocked? Yeah. The, the Screen Actors Guild Awards last night, they yeah. piggybacked Me Too on top of all these older women saying, we're not going to put up with ageism either. I didn't see we it. know that, mm. that different forms of, of oppression intersect uh -huh. and reinforce each other, and I think that's a beautiful example of how different forms of activism can do the same. Yes, mm -hmm. I think that the freedom of being able to, if, you know, it allows people to believe they can do. It's so often, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah look, I've never been, <laughs> if anybody ever came on to me, I came on to them. I mean, I never, I, you know, I, I, I never had that feeling where, you know, I come in fashions, I, in, now we're having problems with it, by the way, people are coming out. But prior to that time, it's a woman's, area so we never get that situation with corporate or when you're trying to get a job in the film industry or music where you have to sort of do something in order to get somewhere uh, you know it's, it's quite different but I definitely believe that if you know when people start to speak out in any arena it helps other people to believe that mm -hmm. they have an they have a point of view let's get out there and say something I think that's what moves legislature I don't think I mean obviously because we've seen what has happened that's changed things especially for me for thinking about the civil rights movement. Right. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's also right now cool to be old because death is so in our super sub consciousness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. More than before, you think? Never before. <laughs> and, and Collectively, you're thinking. Collective, like death is just out there. Death is having a moment. Yeah. Death is having a moment. <laughs> Thank you. And, and it's like old people know that. I mean, old people are already rehearsing. And, and, and so it's cool to be old. Well, it's always been cool to be older than me. I've always, I've always thought the older person is the coolest person. I've always thought that. The young person is kind of cool, but they're not as cool as the oldest person. That's true. And that's the reason why I think young men like me. 
because mm -hmm. I'm, I, I don't think that's the only reason. I think I'm kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> Not because I'm old, but you know. So Liz, I like the fact that you're really like countering usually. So yeah. how do you feel about this and how, what's happening? Is, is, is it the same in Africa or is there a resentment right now towards elderly? Well, I think there's more of a resentment uh, towards younger people and younger yeah. people who just don't have the opportunities, um, whether you're looking at it from a governance perspective where you have brilliant young leaders who are hungry and, and want to lead the development and the leapfrogging of African societies, but just don't have the opportunities. Because they're not respected. Because they're not respected in yeah. the business sector, whether you're, you're thinking about access to capital, um, it's particularly difficult for a young person to uh, raise the capital to start a business. And they're also not nurtured. They're, they're not nurtured, they're not nurtured. yes. yes. They're, they're not mentored. They're not mentored. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I think, so for me, this conversation is particularly interesting because I think about a society where to be young is actually a handicap. Well, you're young. Yeah. And to be a young woman, especially, yes, is a handicap. Because you're a young woman. Well, I'd like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> representing. <laughs> so I wanted to ask Carly, um, many of the examples that you showed were delightful design. And I'm always thinking of the example of uh, OXO, the good grips, mm -hmm. and yeah. Sam Farber, the creator of OXO, that created those good grips because his wife had an impairment of the wrist, and then it became a really successful company. It's what they call in design extended usership. You start something good and then it becomes good for everyone. Um, you showed examples of sublime design, you know, from Barbican to Sao Paulo, they were all great. There's so many designers right now that are working on uh, the integration of different, uh, of different ages and different types of population. Have you encountered some offices in particular that you that we should look at that do special work that is really remarkable? Yeah, it's interesting that those examples, in that case, uh, often it wasn't necessarily an intentional part of the design process, yeah. but it happened. Mm -hmm. to it was just come good up design. That. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And it's interesting to see some of the intergenerational models coming out of the Netherlands, or there's the the primary school with the senior home in Seattle. Yeah. But those are more program based. Mm -hmm. So it, it's. Interesting. I, I'm, I'm sort of collecting, trying to collect the body, but I find that I'm often finding more of the examples through the program than yeah. the design firms themselves. Are you working on a book to collect together these examples? Uh, I should. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it would be, you know, it's, 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 by, it's by example, you know, just, uh, just seeing these great examples of design at all scales that are not only about age, but just simply about living better is so uplifting, yes. right? Yeah, so it really is. So I'm going to open it up also to the audience because there's a, so the first one is here. Yeah, and, uh, over here, the lady with the red sweater. Mm -hmm. And then the second one, can you lift again your arm? Yeah, and then the striped. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for this discussion. So I have a comment and a question. Um, in Europe, there is a movement uh, for mentorship for girls, for women, and I'm talking about traditional, classic, professional business mentorship, where they call it the 3G mentorship, where they're saying the most effective mentorship is when you skip, the mentor is, they skip one generation and go to the next one. Mm. And generation here is 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. So what they're saying, a 25-year-old woman should be mentored by someone who is about 45. And they're mm -hmm. saying this is the most effective way of doing it. So this is a case where ageism is not a theoretical thing. It's not an inclusion thing. It's sort of a reality based on cognitive and experiential mm -hmm. aspects of life. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the uh, question, I'm, I'm originally from India. And the way housing was traditionally built, there would be a courtyard. And in the courtyard is typically where the older people would spend their day basking in the sun, playing with the grandchildren, and so on. Now with urbanization, the traditional way of building built spaces is the Western model of the apartment building. Mm -hmm. And these are all closed spaces. Yeah, these are closed spaces. And my question to you is, the passive impact on ageism due to these structural models is what I'd like to bring out. 
Uh, you, you, do you want to talk <laughs> about it? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's a lot of room right now to build so many more types and models of architecture for an intergenerational futures because right now we see basically only the retirement home, or we're aware of mostly just the retirement home versus aging in place. And like in the UK right now, 2% of um, the housing is, is retirement housing, which only houses 1% of Brits in their 60s. So there's like a massive need for new, new versions. And people in the States, 90% of us want to age in place, but it, it might change if there were more exciting models out there. So I, I think there, there's definitely like the considerations of the architectural features like lighting and, and views and, and access to the, the public realm in, in how those affect people of all ages and in creating these new models are really important things to consider that will create desirable places that might encourage us to downsize rather than aging in place in homes that are maybe too big for us or aren't fit for us. So I think it's exciting to see all the opportunity that could be there if we, if we start to experiment with models with those things in mind. Mm -hmm. Yes, do you have the, oh, thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm thinking about the term um, old soul and um, how you can be an old soul and be young. Um, and then also, I guess, it makes me think about how there's a corollary between wisdom and knowledge. And we've been talking a lot of the context of, of uh, age within acquiring knowledge. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, a little bit about the uh, transcendence of, of wisdom and how that can be approached throughout age. Who wants to wow. take this? Mm -hmm. I love wisdom. Go yeah? <laughs> I love that word. You're not going to like what I say, probably, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll follow you. I think the, that the wise elder is another ageist stereotype. I think that age confers experience, and hopefully we learn from it, so more older people are likely to possess whatever this mysterious thing is, but we do know the wise, you know, the, the old soul in a child. The, the mentoring example, that mentoring might, it might just as uh, likely occur from a younger person to an older one, depending on what the domain of, of expertise is or knowledge. So um, I don't yeah. think, we, it, I think it's a mistake to equate wisdom. With I age. like that. Okay, okay. And I agree with that. We'll get because there. a lot of people who are old are not necessarily wise. That's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it might go reverse. You might want to get rid of your <laughs> wisdom. True. Linda. Well, I, yeah, I'm oh, sorry. thinking because oh, we thought, are in such a time right now. I'm not going to say why. You all know why. <laughs> but that. We're all wise. Everybody's wise. You're all, you're all wise. <laughs> you know, we have to be wise. And uh, Ram Dass talks a lot about uh, <clears throat> uh, things. He wants mindful people around him, as with his stroke, mindful people to put him in the swimming pool mindful people to feed him. And, and we're all studying mindfulness. I mean, Eric Tolle has books up the galore. Um, it, so it's wise to wise now. And, and the, the internet's done it. We've all been to India. We've all <laughs> meditated. <laughs> We're all meditating. What, what are you advocating? Right. No, you, uh, yeah, I, sorry, I interrupted I just, you because I, I thought I you wanna, were done. I just want to go back to what you're saying. I hear what you're saying, but I don't, I don't agree with that per se. I, th I honestly believe that there's a difference between being conscious and being wise. What you're talking about to me is being conscious. We all should be conscious right, right, right now. Right. But when I talk about wisdom, I love what you brought up because there's a, there's a very good thing. There's a lot of young people you meet and you, you hang out with or you're with or you see young and you say, that kid's got an old soul. That's a very beautiful spirit. And wisdom is something that isn't in everyone. It isn't, because I've met a lot of people. And in the end of the day, you meet some people who really, just every time they speak, every time they tell you something, or you come to them, they give you such source of information you never forget. That's wisdom. Or they may not speak. Sometimes yeah. wisdom is in. Oh, well, sure. I mean, you know when to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely when to shut up. Yep. Thank you. Um, I was yeah, thinking about the law versus the culture and what starts. And um, I agree, it's it, culture precedes legislation. But 
um, culture is, is such a difficult thing to shape because it's not just spontaneous and media shapes a lot of our culture and media is always thinking about the young consumer and yet older people um, have a big spending power. I'd love for you all to talk about how, what, and if what's there's anybody here from a marketing company, I would like to understand it also. Yeah. Yeah, because it, it's, yeah. it's shaping, fascinating. Shaping yeah. culture is one thing, huh? but I think it comes from home. I think it's, it comes yeah. from the house. It's kind of amazing that ageism is so persistent that they don't even want to sell us stuff. <laughs> yeah, but why? Yeah, I mean, but because it doesn't well, make sense. One, right? one problem is the internalized ageism of older consumers who don't want to buy anything that telegraphs oldness or disability. But that, no, but that's also, an obstacle. But the, but, but the consumer also, me being a, a senior citizen, I'm not dying to buy fashion like I used to buy it. I'm not dying to buy a lot of things. I'm going to buy land and to buy those little things that people sit and, you know, So they're right, Bethann. They're <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, well, why? I th that's wisdom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so they are right. Okay. <laughs> Oh yeah, Cindy, go so, for it. On behalf of the advertising industry. <laughs> um, no, it's, uh, unfortunately, um, the, the sad fact of the matter is that, uh, and I'm going to speak about you know, my background, which is advertising, so this particular form of popular culture. Right. But the fact of the matter is that the advertising industry itself is extraordinarily ageist. Um, it's extraordinarily ageist yeah. and it's extraordinarily sexist yeah. because 97% of all advertising agency creator directors are men, men. only 3% are women, right. and and the, uh, we are played back to ourselves as consumers through the male lens. And the male lens also applies to us in the industry itself. And women especially are not deemed to be useful to the industry as, as they get older. So when you don't have older creatives, and especially older female creatives, having the opportunity to create the advertising that should absolutely be addressing the extraordinary power of both women consumers and old women consumers, then you just have advertising that results in 90% of women say that they, they can't connect to advertising, advertising doesn't understand them, but, and that, that also embraces ageism. But in the beauty industry, that's us. When it comes down to, I don't see why anybody would want to keep buying things when they get to a certain age. I just don't. I, I really don't. I, I don't get why you can't. You can't make me want to buy any more. I've done it. I've done it. I've done it. I'm done. I mean, I can wear the same outfit for five days straight and feel happy. I mean, I'm not. You know, I'm not trying to. Get, I want to be. I just want to be in Ooh, love. But you can be, exactly want to be in love. Know, I just want to be in love. There's also experiences. With you or you know, anybody. But you know, they can sell you that. experiences. No, though, they right? can. No? I don't think the the aver I agree with you. The and I do know this true because I work with a lot of advertisers. But the fact is, advertisers to me are just in a bubble. They have nothing to offer us. They, even now, they figured out. Oh, let's stop saying anti-aging. Let's not say that anymore. We want that. We want to. We don't want to discriminate. I mean, you know, there are things, I think when you get to a certain age, you should be wise enough not to put up and buy into the bullshit. Mm -hmm. well, that's for sure. That's the, the one thing I would say in response to that, Beth Ann, very briefly, is that, um, and I say this a lot, there's a huge amount of money to be made out of taking women seriously, yeah. especially older women. Yes. And we know when brands want us and they connect with us, that's and then right. we want they what don't. they're going to sell us. Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. This is okay. true. There is a over very there. True. Yes. Uh, hi, I wanted to ask a little bit about ageism in the workplace because I see many women that are not old at all but like took a break to raise their kids and they're in their 40s and they can't go back into the workplace and I can't imagine how it must be for older people. Yeah, and yeah, also for men. Yeah, let's for men, it, of let's course. Not, um, um, let's no, not because be so sexist. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, for people, older well, people. An yeah, interesting true. point about Work, uh, workplace discrimination is that it's often the first form of discrimination that white men encounter. Ah. So I'm itching for oh, some right. of them white to men. get radicalized. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Interesting. I, Linda. I, 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 I love what the Tibetan Buddhists do. And I love what um, Joan Halifax does. And I love what Cindy Brody, who's up in Woodstock, New York, she's a pet. Uh, a pet uh, whisperer and, and a Reiki healer. And what they do is they bless everybody. Like you did as Mother Teresa. And they don't see anything. They don't see age. They don't see anything. Mm -hmm. And they're so happy. So that's true age neutrality. It's, it's everything a, it's, neutrality. It's, Everything mm -hmm. is, everything, and everybody is Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> but, but going back to the AGs, I mean, the workplace, that's where probably legislation could help because you can't yeah. change culture right away, right? Yeah, mm -mm. Right. You're, you're an, uh, a legislation expert, you know, a policy expert. So are there examples of anti-aging, not creams, but policies that you know, anti-ageism policies that you can bring to us as examples, as good examples? Certainly. So in, in the African context, and again, the African Development Bank has uh, been doing a lot of work about inclusion of younger workers. So mm -hmm. in that context, it's younger, brilliant workers who don't have opportunities to leverage their brilliance it's still ageism. and it's mm -hmm. ageism yeah. um, and so I think that that has been uh, the work in uh, in decreasing uh, the uh, dividend um, in in that region has been and and also uh, in in that context uh, where the creative industries for example are industries that are predominantly uh, dominated by younger people and aren't always taken seriously. Um, and so ensuring that the creative industries have their rightful place and that individuals who are involved in those industries can be contributors uh, to the uh, society and to the economic um, society as well. I think that mm -hmm. work has been really uh, pivotal in, in shifting the culture inherently now art is valued more, so young artists um, are respected more than previously where you were an artist because you couldn't become a doctor <laughs> or an engineer. <laughs> Thank you. So we have, um, rep one second and then I'll come to you. I just wanted to ask, I have her and then her. I wanted to ask, because we, we've been talking about aging in Africa, aging in the United States, aging in Europe. Is there anybody that would like to contribute a viewpoint from, say, parts of Asia? We talked about India also. Is there anybody that is here from Korea or China or Japan that would like to add any notations about it? Or that wants to contribute to? No? All right. Then, ah, sorry? I have a question related to your question. But let's see, I still, um, okay, yeah, I'm going to still <laughs> take the other two, yeah. So go ahead. What's your question? My question is, um, we've talked about new aging, and it's a very optimistic sort of take on what it is to age. But mm -hmm. I think one of the things I would have liked to hear discussed is, what about premature aging and maybe parts of the world where adults are perhaps dying or being killed and perhaps war zones or conflict zones? And what is the discourse of aging around, let's say, young children uh, aging prematurely. Oh, um, mature it's a very broad question, uh, but it's one of the points I thought did not mm -hmm. come up in mm -hmm. this discussion. No, that I is didn't even also think about it that is also a new aging, um, okay. the premature aging of a child, for instance. Who wants to take this? Mm -hmm. Well, that seems to me to be a question of premature mortality rather than aging. Uh, you know, it's like that's a function of people not getting a chance to live out their natural lifespan, which is why the, the, the aging of the global population is a remarkable achievement. Yeah, so um, that's like a collective aging, right, yeah. in a way. Yeah. Once again, based on culture. There was, um, yeah, over there, the lady with the glasses. Yeah. That's right. mm -hmm. uh, thank you all for a really riveting conversation and, and points, but I just want to ask a question. In this day and age with the technology, of you know computers and iPhones and texting and the way people communicate, I mean, how does how does that play into working with this aging population and older people? Um, I so my, mo my mother passed my mother passed away almost twenty years ago, and I remember several years before she died, she said, "What does WWW mean? I see that on every sign everywhere. What is that?" You know, so, and I just, and I thought it was the cutest question in trying to explain right. what that meant. So technology mm -hmm. and how it helps the integration of elderly people or how it helps elderly people? Any, you know, I, I mean. Well, technology and how it helps old, elderly people? Well, yeah. just communicating, yeah. I mean, typefaces are so families, small. Children, it's, been, it's been very helpful to a lot of people. You know, they, they, they get a chance to see their children who live far away from them. They have mm -hmm. FaceTime. Um, when, when people travel, they get a chance to do it in that way. They have communications. You know, they can move around with the phone. I'm still locked into landline myself with a cell. But there are many people who have that. And it is wonderful in that way. But it gets a little hard sometimes. They need their younger 
children or family members to help them to understand how to do more advanced things with it. I think it's, it's I can wonderful. tell you there's um, uh, But at the, least they don't walk down the street looking at it, though. They don't do that. <laughs> there's That's a sure. design company that in, in England that a few years ago did an experiment about uh, elderly that had lost her companion and created these uh, oh, connections yes. through social media with South, the South Work Circle to, you know, at first these people didn't want to even go out, there was depression, there yeah. was, you know, just like this debilitating uh, sadness that really crippled them also physically, so reconnecting them digitally enabled them to jumpstart a social life. That but a social life <laughs> to, to real humans. Yes, yeah. you know, afterwards, I mean, there's yes. There's a tremendous yeah. amount of sort of techno-optimism around, you know, gizmos are going to make it you yeah, know, make you cure everything right. about aging, and uh, I think that's because there's such a huge market. But I think a lot of it is delusory and profit-driven. Yay, Paula, Can uh, I can I just add one more small um, thing? <laughs> very small. A typefaces. How do we change that people can read oh, things? Older people and that's for labels education. and iPhones. But that's a whole big deal. And now we have another question there, but we'll get that's that's huge. I know. But, that's yeah, true. over here, Michelle. That's like. Uh, yeah, you, you can, can talk really loud. Yeah, it's coming to you. Okay. Yeah, here it is. <laughs> we believe you. <laughs> and then there. Okay. Um, this is more for Carly. I have a question about the built environment and accessibility. Does any of your work involve dealing with the public space like sidewalks, transportation, yeah. parks, park benches? Exactly, yeah. I'm mostly focused on the public realm and looking at um, how maybe in policy where that those in-between spaces are sometimes missed and mm -hmm. sometimes in the standards too. Um, but also looking at like specific things like armrests and, and sort of trying to explain to designers like why not add that when it helps so many people. It's, it's sort of make, giving people awareness of it that it, it can still be the great design you were thinking of but just having that there you know really makes it more beneficial to everyone. So. I'm, those are the sort of the, the realm of architecture that I'm, I'm most interested in working on and, and bringing more awareness to the, the benefits of access. What are Does, you doing in London? London has this really old arcade subway system. So the question is about London and the subway system? Yeah, with London, yeah, it's really interesting. Right now they're building the Queen Elizabeth line to extend across the Oh, the whole city so that with that when they're creating the new stations they're really trying to, to tie in the access but it's interesting too when you're comparing it to the existing stations that are oftentimes very inaccessible and when you Not actually as inaccessible as New York's <laughs> yeah. yeah when you look at the accessibility map of the London tube it's really like five of the so many stations that you can actually are fully disability accessible so it's a major issue of not only when they're creating the new master plans, which there are many of in London right now, of making from scratch the accessibility piece, but how we retrofit or, or adapt the existing environment. So it, it's, I think they are doing a lot of really great work in London on that, but there's, there's a lot to be done still. Erica, you have somebody there? Thank you all so much for an insightful panel. When I heard someone talk about the World Health Organization and thinking about how that could be problematic as, it, as in terms of how they think about aging and health. Uh, have you all been engaged with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, 17 goals to transform the world, and one of them happens to be working with cities, and then now I'm thinking that all the goals might, should have an agenda looking at ageism. So, Ashton? Huh? We actually, we have an expert in the audience who works on Where? exactly that. Yay. Um, mm -hmm. There you are. Yeah, I know. I was looking at you. Exactly. Yeah, let's give her the... What I am, I'm not sure I'm an expert, but mm -hmm. I'm a sponge in getting all of this information. Hi, Carly. I'm Kathy Klein, and I'm actually the co-chair for a group called um, the General Assembly Partners Civil Society for the Upcoming Habitat. And we made a huge difference and still remain relatively invisible, no matter what the demographics show. But there are opportunities, and I'm going to bring your examples, Carly, to Kuala Lumpur in two weeks, where there's a chance to talk about how do we actually see implementation, successes, and challenges with the new urban agenda, which is the document that came out of Habitat 3 a year and a half ago. I know there has been serious critique of the World Health Organization for leaving older people out of the, their sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. Need to change culture, yeah. Oh, 
There's a, oh, Nancy? Yeah, lady over there in the middle. This has been incredibly, incredibly insightful, I know, several of you. Um, one thing about the new aging that we haven't really, we've touched on, but we haven't really gotten into is it's not just getting old, but getting very old. This is sort of a brave new world. There are a lot of people living into their 90s. Yeah, not the young um, old, but the old, old. Right. My, my yeah. mother's 96. Ooh. And to Paula's earlier point, um, she has late onset on Alzheimer's. Two years ago, she failed every neurological test. She's been going to Meet Me at MoMA, um, Metascapes, all these programs at museums. And I take her everywhere. I took her out to Colorado. I mean, I drive her around. She doesn't ski, but um, it, it's amazing. Two years later, she aced her test. And I asked the doctor ah. if it was a misdiagnosis, and he said no, but you can stimulate the parts of the brain that are still working. Mm -hmm. And so I guess my challenge to all of you is we are living old to be older and older and older than, than previously. And people today think of getting old just shoving them into an old age home or going to visit grandpa. So, but people can go out. And finding ways to get older people to be able to go out, is it a so robot? So you're, you're asking how that can be, how, how the can world we, can be accommodated also for that. Yeah, using all of your skills. It's just, just interesting, too, I just want to say that something that interesting that Paolo told mentioned to us on the phone. You said, you know, I was talking to you about films and stuff like that, and you said, and I talk about my age, and you said, yes, I've just left a woman the other day that did her first documentary at the age of 90. Oh, yeah, Joan Cron. I mean, that's... Yes. Joan Cron is this amazing woman. She just turned 90, and she just distributed her first documentary, and it's pretty good a movie. Yes. Yeah, you so, know, so, And she's I, I, working and I, on the next. Yeah. And just mm -hmm. adding to that, it's just so wonderful to know that you, you know, I worry too, like, okay, I have to, you know, I'm, I'm all about making a plan. You know, if you loved your life coming in and you did it, you better be the one to take care of your life going out. And I think when you're saying that, you know, I used to say, oh God, I don't want to live until I'm 90 because I'll probably outlive my money and then who's going to take care of me and what would I, you know, I, I, I want to be active. So, you know, I start boxing, I'm doing everything because I want to just take care of me and probably hang out with you and your mom. And at the end of the day, you know, you just want to be live, right? Yeah. yeah. Linda, I mean, oh, sorry. It was Linda was also. I, I'm, mm. not, I'm not an expert in dementia care, but I do know that in the, you know, progressive end of the field, there is, you know, enormous efforts towards keeping people with Alzheimer's in the community as much as possible and to destigmatizing it. I mean, even to have the diagnosis be, you know, you can't diagnose Alzheimer's until you're autopsied, actually. So to not, again, a theme everywhere is, you know, that these binaries between old and young or disabled and not, you know, able to, are, are false. Autistic. And likewise with dementia, that mm -hmm. there's an awful lot a person with dementia can do, especially if we're not, a, if we're less afraid of it and if we are, you know, like you, energetic and courageous enough and generous enough to integrate them into your life and your social circle. Linda, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm into certified nursing assistants and caregivers as being the saints. Yeah. Those okay. are our saints. Yeah. Let's, let's give it up. <laughs> give it up. <laughs> true. Ultimately, I think there's a lot we can learn from other battles that have been fought and are still being fought. I'm, I'm thinking of the idea of spectrum when it comes to autism and when it comes to, in Italy, you don't say disabled, you say differently abled, which is kind of cute, but yeah. it, it's also yeah. Yeah. very deep. But, and I, but, but I feel that the CNAs <laughs> and the caregivers are the new something. We whatever. love them, yeah. The new, the, the new design. They're the new cool. The new, yeah. <laughs> They're the new cool. And for them to be trained in mindfulness, for them to get a good wage, yes, for, them to, yeah. for them to be given a They're massage so right, a yeah. week yeah. themselves, yeah. Yeah. for them to, yeah. to, to right. benefit. Yeah. For, these are the people... Look! Look at how the Zen for them to get cared for. For them to yeah. look at how the Zen communities are are training Zen caregivers. Look at look at the spiritual communities and how they're training people to take care of us. Yeah, there, Erica, you there's have one? there's something there. Yes, I, I was thinking about the way 
cultural changes occur and the import importance of language either as a trigger to cultural change or as a, something that reflects cultural changes that has occurred. And so my question would be, do you think we need the different rhetorics, a different language, a different word to refer to age and to elderly people? Or maybe we don't. Mm. I, I think we need to be less afraid of the words that are out there. Um, and I think, I mean, one, one really good trick to think about your own language is how you use the words old and young, because we have a tendency to say, you know, I hear people say, I don't feel old. And what they mean is I don't feel ugly or useless <laughs> or incompetent. And, you know, I, I felt all those things when I was 13, much worse oh God, than I feel so them old. now. <laughs> so to try and, and uh, you know, replace, insert bad thing, you know, for, for, for old and good thing for young with the actual word for what you're feeling, which likely has nothing to do with how old you are. <laughs> And I, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's so much language as it is an acceptance that age yeah, is yeah, a yeah. physiological change that we real. will all experience. Absolutely. And there are many things that come with aging. And I think uh, less of an emphasis on the segmentation of young versus old, aged versus not <coughs> aged, and the identification of language that sort of feels comfortable to connect those two. I mean, I have solved I think the problem that's where the of opportunity what, to call, is. what to call old people, olders and youngers. I use olders them as, noun, as nouns in my <laughs> work because it emphasizes that age is a spectrum. We're all older than somebody and younger than someone else. And you know, old, nothing wrong with old except in a culture that stigmatizes the word no one wants to identify as it, whereas most of us will readily cop to being older if you have more road behind you than ahead. So the Kosa uh, people of South Africa actually think of aging as a process of perfecting adulthood. Nice. And I think that if we could embrace more of, of, of that perspective, I think we would need to have this conversation uh, that we're having today. I, I want to add to that too that I don't think so much is about I don't care about what Beautiful. word you I don't care if you call me old I don't care I, I don't care about <laughs> language I really don't I never but I do think it's so important to get to know older people mm -hmm. I think it's important for older people to have that experience of young, other people coming to know them we we as you've said all of you pretty much have said people sort of disengage from the mm -hmm. elder the people are older because they think they have nothing in common with them. But I think it's so many great things you can, you can give to them and you can gain from having, mm -hmm. getting to know. I, I love when young people say, oh, I have a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Somebody who's in their 40s says, I have a friend who's 80. I love that. That's, that to me is real cool. That's cool. Did you, did you <laughs> no, see actually, the story yeah, yeah. in the Times a few weeks ago about uh, Young, I think he was 19 years old from oh, Washington, yes, D.C. Yes, yes, yes. yeah. With the boyfriend. Mm -hmm. With the wife. With, with uh, an older friend who uh, oh, lived oh. in Florida, and I think she was 80-something, 80, 80 and they played uh, Words with Friends. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And, and, uh, I thought, I, I thought the, 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 the guy who was like 20-something and the woman who was 90 or something, they were, they were boyfriend-girlfriend? Well, Harold and Maude. <laughs> no, well, better than that, they were. <laughs> well, there's a movie True. coming out now with the Matt Benning and... <laughs> Uh, go ahead. Well, a, a really natural, um, on the topic of language, I think there's so much conversation around the future of work, but that all be associated with automation and machine. And I think to, to go off of that, you know, the future of work should also be the future of home care work and what is happening in that. Um, my question is derived from Atul Gawande's book on um, how he was saying with regards to culture that we're no longer in the West venerating older adults. But we're also not necessarily venerating youth. Instead, we're venerating independence. Yeah. And autonomy aside, respecting autonomy aside, my question is, because we live in an age of digital connection, yet social isolation, how to create more intergenerational community? Is it through programming, policy, public spaces? Are there any radical ideas that you guys have? I'm a college student, and I realize the only times I interact with older adults are when I choose to engage in religion and my own grandparents. Yeah, and I think that's a, a huge sense. problem. Yeah. Who wants I to think, take this? This is so interesting. I think this is where, be, <laughs> just I think there's a real just opportunity behind. with the world rapidly urbanizing. I think, how do we develop cities that embrace this concept of intergenerational living where spaces have multiple uses? Uh, so it's not, 
just building a courtyard where young and old uh, can interact, but a courtyard that can have multiple uses, um, that can be a, a center for uh, social convening and building cohesion in communities. Um, I think that those are some of the qualities um, that we should strive to uh, embed in our uh, development of cities. Um, I would argue that the built environment certainly um, plays <clears throat> plays a big role in creating these sort of societies that embrace uh, this connectivity. Yeah, and I make the personal side of that, the radical act, and it shouldn't be radical, is to seek out relationships with people much, in your case, because you're fairly young, much older than you. I mean, and I know that's, you know, that, that seems like a hard thing to do. It has to be an authentic connection, but think of something you like to do, whether it's reading or hiking or butterfly collecting, well, I'm sure that's politically But how, how does she um, find them? You know, but how does she even find she them? She thinks of something she likes to do and then finds, you know, Meetup or mm -hmm. Facebook or mm -hmm. whatever, campus. or a campus group. Yeah. I mean, campuses do have a bunch of activities. Find a mixed age group to do it with. When I, or, went, yeah. when I got to London, I was looking to meet older people to um, talk about my research with and just hang out with them and be friends. And the Barbican, I think, was a great center for that because the plaza was surrounded by mixed abuses that had galleries, libraries, uh, shows, and of all different types. So it brought a lot of people there. And then in the library, I stumbled upon a knitting group that was full of all ages because is a great yeah, because mm -hmm. they taught us how to knit, and, and anyone could show and up, and it was free. Talk, and yeah. and those like non-consumer public space and events are mm -hmm. super great for that. And then so that was one example where I found my friend Lena, who's 92 and lived in the Barbican, so I got to learn about the history there with her. And then the other example was seeking out one of my interests. So I was looking at this architecture group that was th with through the Building Exploratory, and they happened to have a lifelong learning program. So then I got to go and look at London with a group of 65 plus older adults that were m many like experts in different realms Olders. of the field. But, but yes. do you think it's because you're just you two either? It's because you're you're an old soul, um, <laughs> and that maybe that's the reason why. Because a lot of people, I mean, what you're asking, I, did, I I missed it. I thought I was understanding something else you were asking. Um, but do you think it's really? Don't you think that's because you're special? <laughs> I mean, because that's not. Because there's not many. She's special. But yeah. as an architect, you yeah. look for the real. Yeah. I mean, if you're a good architect, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you look for the opportunity to develop something new. That's right. To add to and the you, world. And you and you and you're a sponge yeah. for information I'm for wherever for you. Come. <laughs> yeah, you're like not here now. You're, you're a sponge. <laughs> of, where, 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 wherever you can get the knowledge, you're grabbing yeah. it from. But, but it's true when you're saying as a college kid. I mean, you got the college thing down. You see it around you, right? But how is it that you're going to begin to change what's happening amongst your own generation? That's what I thought you were asking. I see. Yeah. I'm not so old. Linda, you wanted to say I, something? I, yeah, I, I live uh, 10 minutes <clears throat> from Woodstock, New York. And Woodstock, New York, Woodstock is not over, believe me. Definitely not. <laughs> I'm in Sorbonne's. It's definitely oh. not. <laughs> oh, my God, we're neighbors. Yeah. Uh, Woodstock has parades. They have Thanksgiving, so they oh, have Christmas, <laughs> they have they Halloween, have Halloween, Halloween parade, yeah. they, and everybody. Gay pride? There. Do they have they gay pride? Have, they have no, that. poetry night. <laughs> they <laughs> have square dancing. They have the elders theater group. And they still have bare people around. They have dancing. Are you inviting her there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're all invited. So yeah. it's, it's inevitable. So so why don't we make more small communities? This. All yeah. right. So we're going to we're going to create a few online opportunities. Last question for Brief you and comment. then we'll go drink. First to the young lady in front of me. Everywhere I go, I ask people questions. I don't step out of my life. If I'm in a museum, if I'm on the bus, I ask people of different ages questions about what they think about what we're living through in that moment. Yeah. And it engages me with people of different ages yeah. first. Um, two comments very briefly. In my work, my research, I work on food and faith largely in Brazil. I work with a lot of people who are older, women generally are 50 to 100 years of age. And I've learned who practice African traditional religious uh, religions, and they say they look forward to being an ancestor. So even if they get diagnosis of hypertension as African descendants, the idea of death is inviting because they can come back and be an ancestor, yes. which is very intriguing. Yeah. 
And lastly, my, both of my parents are deceased and died at home. My mother had dementia, many diseases. My father and I took care of her. And when he became ill at 90, one of the things that happened, he came back from a stroke and was pretty cognizant, but he didn't want to go back home because that old woman on the second floor where their bedroom was, was there and she might take him too. And so his very intelligent man, but the rhetoric of ageism, ageism got to him because he equated this place that he didn't want to go to. And yet when I tried to invite him into my life, he didn't want to be a burden to me. And last but not least, my mother's, uh, my aunt, when in her 80s, said, I don't want to be like those old people. And it took her dying to make me understand that she meant elderly. So yes. you think, you're saying that it crosses, it's that, just it, an embedded It's so embedded prejudice. that we need to really, the rhetoric really matters that... Uh, well, I would say that this is a good closing. You know, we know, you know, we've talked about it for two hours. We heard wonderful contributions, but still there's a lot of work to do to make it become a spectrum and not anymore a barrier. Yeah. But I, I want to thank you because you were fantastic. I really thank learned you. a lot. And thank you. And please, uh, please stay on. There's going to be our usual mediocre wine and great conversation outside. <laughs> and uh, February 28th is going to be protest. Yeah. Mediocre <laughs> wine and great conversation. <laughs>